That is the truth. And it's shallow thinking that leads to division, not deep thinking. Deep thinking will always have humility about it because there is always more to be discovered. It is shallow thinking that leads to division. Well, thank you everybody for coming along. It's nice to see some new faces and then of course some returning ones. We might have a few people still joining us. We'll welcome them as we go. So this is for you guys as well. I think this is the sixth time we've gathered in this space together and we've explored different topics. And of course, we have a very, very interesting context to move into today together as well. And we'll begin to unfold that. I'd love to introduce each person sitting next to me as we go. But if it's okay, I'd like to say just a couple things as well. Just setting the stage a little bit for the evening to come some of the hopes, I think, and maybe in some ways one or two principles that can help to guide us as we begin to interact in relation to some of this context, in relation to this topic, of course. This was headlined as an interfaith dialogue, which itself is very, very interesting if we really want to be with the meaning of faith and the meaning of dialogue. Hey, these are, these are beautiful things. These are incredible things. And to really relate with them in and of itself is to presence a way of being with each other that in many respects speaks to some profound significance of what it is to be a being. So that's pretty cool. And then the other part to it is meaning, tradition and progress. And so that itself is a very potent set of concepts, eh? And um, I'm looking forward to exploring them together. So, one of the things that is perhaps not so common, but when it can be lived together, is I think a really beautiful thing, and that's a certain kind of silence. It's a silence before we give voice, it's a silence before we speak. And particularly in the context of topics where there might be quite a bit of difference presenced, you know, in potentially ways that might challenge us or provoke feelings in us that are powerful, it's often helpful to be with the energy of that, begin to pay attention to it, recognize in some sense the fertility that that energy offers in the context of silence and come into awareness of what it is to share voice in relationship with that silence together. It's a tremendously powerful thing when a group of people can be with that process. And then in many ways, there's an aspiring art form there that we can all develop because it's an art form that allows us to help each other see. It's an art form that allows us to help each other know and to experience different perspectives and in that way participate in a kind of whole making. And all of that really is just a kind of supporting it's something supportive, but it's also a hope for what we can create together in terms of a context that can really be with profound topics in our time and challenging energies. There's so many things in culture, you know, there's so many things about life, about nature, about existence, which can be very challenging, tremendously complex, but also so profound and, and beautiful to relate with. And my hope anyway, and thank you, you know, to each one of you for meeting me in this process this evening. My hope is that we can develop a context, and I say this every month, we can develop a context of relationality that allows us to be with difference, allows us to be with different perspectives, and allows us to grow our capacity to know the world in a more beautiful way. And so, thank you for that. And now, uh, We'll begin the part where we have a dialogue here um, between the four of us, and we'll see where that goes. So I want to begin with Lindsay, Bishop Lindsay Owen, and we met in a cafe, which is a beautiful thing. He's the barista there. Well, that's one of his jobs. I hope you're not just a barista, otherwise I've been misled. But, uh, <laughs> but that's one of the hats. And uh, I really appreciated Lindsay's presence and the conversation we shared together on a couple of occasions. 
And ever since meeting Lindsay, I thought, well, it would be a beautiful thing to create a context in which we can share that presence together to welcome others in that context and, um, you know, um, look to and ask questions of Lindsay's perspective and his learning uh, because my sense is that there's something really worthwhile to relate with. Um, and I just felt that at a spiritual level. And so it's, um, yeah, it's, it's very nice to welcome you, Lindsay. Thank you. Yeah, and uh, joining Lindsay, I'll go next in a row, is Sita. Sita and I met relatively recently as well. Um, Sita's stepping forward today in the context of a journey of practice and learning in the context of Sufism, which is a, in a it's like a mystical branch associated with um, Islam. Now, I'm not a scholar of these things. I'm not even a historian of them. I think of Sufism. I think mysticism. I think language that sounds Arabic or Persian. And I've already outed myself there as a complete fraud when it comes to the history of religion, because of course those are very different things. But it's okay. <laughs> um, I have related a little bit with, uh, with some writings and what have you from it. And um, it's, it's a pleasure to welcome you, Sita. And, uh, and Sita also uh, works at Ceres, which a number of you will know as well. She's one of the directors there, which is really awesome. And maybe we will speak about that. Maybe we won't. Um, but, you know, maybe one day it'd be nice to visit that too. And then also we have Kirk. Kirk is a Zen Roshi. And um, we also shared a really interesting conversation. And I know he's curious to be here. That's what we keep saying to each other. Yeah, I'm curious. What's going to happen? I don't know. I'm curious. So he's probably still curious, as am I, and we have to see what happens. Um, and so for me, it's, uh, it's a real fun and exciting experience to, um, to gather this together. Because, you know, it, uh, it evokes, I think, a very deep, a very deep kind of um, seeking from me that's certainly there. And on the other hand, I also feel like I am, I feel like I'm, I feel like I'm in the moment of something that um, in a way I've done before. Maybe it's, I've had that many dreams in some sense about what it is to get together with people um, who have pursued paths of wisdom and learning. And my hope is that it is possible to gather and to benefit from the many paths yeah, that have been lived by many people. Now, this is not the, most, not the best way to say whatever I was trying to say there. But that's that. So they're the introductions. And so we haven't prepared anything specific here today. I hope over the course of the evening we'll better relate with these notions of meaning, tradition and progress and what have you. So you're welcome to weave in with that, those threads as much as you like. But it did strike me that you know, a beautiful way to begin would be to ask. Um, and what I like to do often in the online sessions, I like to leave it to the silence a bit. And so maybe to stoke a little less sort of traditional way some of these situations happen where I ask someone a very direct question. I sort of posit this to each of you and whoever feels called, you know, please, you know, step in and respond. I'd love to actually hear from each of you about this. And that is, what does faith mean to you? Or perhaps another way to say it, um, what does the sacred mean to you? And how have you come to experience that in your life? Let's find out. It's interesting word, faith. Um, in Zen, there are three necessaries for practice. One is great faith, and that's faith that others have tried this practice and have found liberation or found awakening or found intimacy through it. The other, though, is great doubt. You do not trust this until you actually have metabolized this in your own life, when it's an actual experience that you know for certain because you have experienced it. And the third one is great perseverance, that this often is going to be a lifetime uh, of, of experience and of, of winnowing this through, of reconciling these, this great faith and great doubt for many people. So. Uh, when you're asking about great faith, that's the practice. It's great faith, great doubt, and perseverance. Beautiful. Thank you. I think there are, um, 
there are parallels in the traditions, actually. Um, um, from my perspective, I think that um, you can't separate faith and trust by, by definition. Really, faith is not the same as um, some forms of knowledge, though it's not as different as it might be. Faith is uh, the trust in things unseen, actually. And in, in our tradition, trust in something that you trust about the future. And you live as if that future is true in, in the Christian tradition. And that is the, the future that is eternal. So you live today trusting in what you believe about what the future will be. And in, in our tradition, the tradition I belong to, it's interesting, in our cafe recently, it's been so interesting um, to come out as a Christian in Brunswick. <laughs> because, you know, quite a lot of what the church does, I, I've realised we, we do unwittingly, sort of secretly. I mean, you can't, you can't come to a church with my church's window and look in because it's stained glass. And then we go over to the hall for coffee. And so when we started this cafe on Sydney Road, um, and you walk in and there's a crucifix, and people say, and some people think it's just our vibe. I was once asked if um, we, we were dressing up and pretending, you know, to just to be something different. You know? And uh, another group came in and said, yeah. Ironic Christians. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Love the Catholic vibe, another group came in. And, and then some people just won't come in. So it's been a very interesting experience. Um, but um, and one person came in and said, the trouble with you is you're just too old-fashioned. And actually, I can't. I'm not old-fashioned enough, from my perspective. Because the, the, just as you talked about, the, you, you, you trust that there are people who've gone before who have done this and, and discovered this truth. Similarly, in, in our tradition, we're 2,000 years old. I remember some years ago being with a group of Benedictine abbots and abbesses from this when I was living in the UK, both Anglican and Roman Catholic, all together for a conference. And the Catholic bishop was there, and I was there as an Anglican bishop. And it was like being with people 1,500 years old, which is when St. Benedict started that tradition of the monasteries. And it was being with deep people. And so faith is, in some sense, from our tradition, in the future, and yet it, it strength lies in people who've lived it now. And the now has covered so far anyway, 2,000 years, and of course because it's a Judeo-Christian tradition, um, longer than that. And um, of course for me, I discover how I'm to live a life as a human being, fundamentally and primarily from looking at Jesus. That for me is the reference point of, of the good life, really, and trust that what he says and what he did and what happened to him in his death and resurrection, becomes absolutely fundamental. That may seem crazy, but uh, somehow, I suppose, like everything else, um, you only discover where the relationship is right if you begin having the relationship. And in having the relationship, you discover whether it's right or not, or true or not. And that's, I think that's true about every religious tradition. You can stand on the edge of the swimming pool, or you can jump in. And um, it's in the jumping in that there's a possibility of discovering that the faith actually is believable and worth living. Yeah, yeah I think. Thank Sorry you. Sorry to go on. No, but I, so, Sita, I'm wondering if we could potentially, and it's a difficult thing, you know, these are very, these are very hard things to express, I think, for a number of reasons, but the notion of the sacred, and we have here also presents sort of a relationship between faith and doubt and also the necessity of taking a leap and so I'm wondering if there's a way in which you could speak to what the sacred means for you and if on your journey of developing a relationship with that you've also experienced a relationship as Kirk and Lindsay have spoken to between faith and doubt along the way. Thanks, and I just want to say what an honour it is to be set here between these two amazing teachers. <laughs> um, and that my practice of Sufism 
is very Western one. I just want to acknowledge that the vast majority of Sufis in the world come from an Islamic culture and faith tradition and that the tariqa or path that I'm part of sort of started in the Middle East um, or in Persia and then came down through the north of India and then into the west um, just a couple of generations ago. Um, and so the, um, the Sufi path that I'm part of does have that kind of traditional Sufi um, uh, belief that there is a teacher that holds this particular tradition and that's passed on through a direct transmission from teacher to teacher. Um, so my particular tradition is called the Nakshbandiya Mujadadiya tradition um, and my teacher is Emmanuel Vaughan Lee. Um, uh, so yeah, it's, and the way that we speak about Sufism in my tradition is that it's not so much um, a religion, but something that, I mean, Idris Shah wrote a lot about Sufism and he talked about how it, it predating um, Islam, which I'm sure Islamic Sufis would wholeheartedly disagree with, um, but it's more like an essence and a heart. The central practice of Sufism is a connection in the heart. Um, there's a connection between the student and the teacher, and there's this transformational process of love. Um, and so that's kind of the central experience of my Sufi practice. Um, and strangely enough, I came to it, I grew up going to an Anglican church <laughs> every Sunday with my mother. And then when I um, didn't kind of, I feel like your, to, to your question about um, the sacred and um, faith, I feel like I came into the world with something that I knew to be real. And that even as a small child looking around in the church, I was looking for a reflection of this thing that I felt in myself and never really found it in the churches. And actually I had a brief chat with Lindsay earlier and I was like, if I had met someone like Lindsay back then, I may have stayed in the church. But I personally never found what I was looking for. And then I went on a journey um, uh, to study philosophy. And then um, as part of that, I, um, like we spoke about the other day, I discovered um, one of the subjects that I did at university was called Philosophy East and West. Um, <laughs> and I came across Sufism for the first time um, and also um, Buddhism. And um, my, te my teacher at university, two things about um, Buddhism that I remember were one, that it was the first time I heard the phrase, there are many paths to the one truth and the Buddhists say this I remember him saying that and for me that was that first reflection of that thing that I felt as a child which I thought must be true there must be many paths to this one thing that I think of as faith or truth or whatever so I really liked this this idea um, and the other thing concept that I came across was this idea of um, you don't just read about um, Buddhism or even Christianity you have to practice it um, and I think that was the first time that concept really kind of landed in my mind that I could do all the reading I wanted about um, Buddhism, but I was never going to be a Buddhist until I did the practices. Um, then, you know, I didn't sort of find Sufism or find my Sufi teacher or the teacher found me probably about 10 years after that. Um, and um, what I'm currently interested in and exploring about this idea of the sacred is this intersection between, um, I used to call it, it was spiritual ecology. This book came out by um, a Sufi teacher, Llewellyn Vaughan Lee, who's the father of my teacher on spiritual ecology. And it had in these two words, these two things that I really cared about. And actually, um, when I was sitting down thinking about this talk, I realized that those two things, spirituality and ecology, are really connected through our bodies and that we experience the world through our senses and through the breath and through our practices and through doing these things. And so this is what I'm exploring at the moment, this kind of thread that I'm pulling on yeah. in my life is mm, the, um, I don't know if that answers the question about the sacred, but I think um, the earth body is the most sacred thing I can think of. Mm. Can I say something about the sacred? Um, I think one of the most challenging uh, truths is that actually, uh, I mean, I, I have a religious building that actually speaks of the sacred in lots of ways, and I believe in sacred spaces really as being really important, soft places for people. But the truth is, I'm in the presence of the sacred now. You are sacred in our tradition. However dusty you are, if 
that's a nice way of explaining how you know, I do the things I don't want to do, says St. Paul. I don't do the things I ought to do. The stuff I've done in my life, I think, oh, Lord. But, but, but in, 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 the, in the religious tradition that I come from and try to live, and I'm really sorry that we failed you, actually. I really am. Um, because Christianity is deep and sometimes appears to be shallow. And I'm sorry about it. But actually, that's probably true about me, too. Is a, is a, is a, is a discovery... I don't make anything sacred. I discover the sacred. And I, as an act of discipline, I have to see you as sacred. Because in, in the language of our tradition, you're made in the image of God. In other words, your life is intended. However, it began in a physical sense. And some people's lives begin by accident. I mean, we know the physical thing. Some comes out of lovemaking, and some comes out of other situations whatever the circumstance. Uh, there's a Christian tradition of the use of the word beginning. And you, you can say, oh, I began to have a headache. And that beginning doesn't really matter all that much. But your life began as a sort of inauguration. And because uh, in our tradition, we believe that um, not a sparrow falls from a tree without the love of God that no one is made except out of love, whatever the human circumstances. And so uh, I begin by saying that the earth is sacred from an tradition because it's made and intended to be out of love. And what's true of the earth is true of every person on it. And that's where in our tradition you, you, every person has a dignity not because I give it to you, because frankly, if we waited for human beings to give each other dignity, how fragile would that be? Rather, I'm called to discover your dignity, which is inherent to who you are, in my tradition anyway, because there is, a, there is an objective God, a relational God, who, who makes us, who draws us into being. And how dare I argue with that? How I dare I contradict that? Um, so sacred can sometimes be a word that's charged with religion and places and sacred actions, and I believe in all those things. But actually, what would be the use of all that if I don't discover that the person next to me is sacred? And therefore, I may disagree entirely with you, but I still have to reverence you. And I reckon we could do with more of that. Yeah. Thank you, Lindsay. Kirk, there was something that occurred to me to ask you to speak on here, if you can. I was going to use the word uh, revelation, but that is a word which carries many connotations. And it was coming to me more in the sense of this sense of discovery. What I'm picking up a lot on is a participation, a cultivating a relationship in life with oneself, with what one encounters. And that in undergoing that experience, in participating in that way, we can come to notice, we can reveal a dynamic, an order, a way, a nature of reality, a truth, truths of experience that, for instance, could be referenced from a Zen perspective, perhaps with notions like emptiness, and we could speak to what it is to come to awareness of the connectivity between things and the, the inseparability of ourselves in process with process, with life, with life, with death. And so I'm kind of curious if it's possible and you know, if you feel like you need to weave with other things, please do. But could you speak to the, this discovered aspect, the uncovering through practice of a way in which you found your experience and the nature of how you understand yourself and who you are? How has that changed? And in what way could you speak to this coming into a kind of awareness? That's one of the things that's being spoken to here in some important sense, a coming into awareness of the sacred. Yes. Um we often talk about these 
enlightenment moments in Zen. We don't really actually use the word enlightenment very much anymore, more realization or intimacy or more accurate. Uh, and there's a sort of sense that they come from outside, that they, you know, uh, you see a, a duck fly by and you're, uh, all of a sudden you find realization in that moment. <laughs> it's just done it for you. That yeah. duck was the thing that just tipped it, yeah. But it's actually more that you, in Zen, what we practice is being reachable. We practice holding ourselves open to being, um, to be uh, ready to uh, be intimate with everything as it arises. The freedom in Zen doesn't come because we are aiming for some particular state of mind or that we're aiming for some uh, lofty ideal, but that whatever comes up, we find our freedom in that. That we're not trying to find freedom from troubles or find freedom as a state of mind that we are, arrive at, but freedom in the midst of everything that happens. The Zen practice of Zazen is a practice of uh, just being with things as they are. And that sounds easy, uh, it sounds very easy, just being with things as they are, but believe me, I'm been working on it a few years now and still working on it. <laughs> the right. sense that, that every, you know, we were talking about this word sacred, and I appreciate that a sense that everything is sacred. Um, that, uh, that's almost like that every aspect of our, we are in love with our life as it is, moment by moment, breath by breath. And that's the practice of Zen. Yeah, thank you. I mean, a question came to me then, it's a bit of a silly one. You know, and how are things? How did you find them? Would you describe yourself as someone who went through a process in which, and I appreciate it's an ongoing, and I, I would certainly emphasize that aspect too. But I have heard in, across a number of different spiritual traditions, people do use terms like awakening. People do mm. refer to critical experiences. Now, you know, I have various views about this. It certainly is the case that we can have climactic episodes in our lives and in that sense we can enter an experience one way and have a profound sense of identity transformation in a, in a relatively short period of time. And I'm just wondering, I, I don't, don't believe that is the only, I personally don't believe that is the only way to cultivate a relationship with oneself. I think there can be in some important sense uh, a certain gradual relating and then, you know, after so many revolutions of transformative process perhaps when the duck flies by you're like ah that's similar to the whatever other animal you might want to choose do you know what i mean and did you undergo a uh, like a real step function shift in your own experience how do you relate to that realization as a as a sharp or major transition it's funny, we sort of, one of the pro prohibitions is we never talk about our own big awakening experiences because it makes us have to be like, hmm. <laughs> uh, and there's all sorts of ego projections that go with that. So, but I, I will say that what experiences I have had, I recognize something that had happened to me as well in childhood or playing music. My, probably the biggest experience that I had in my life came before I actually came to Zen, and I was walking alone in a mountain, and just, it felt like the whole, something really big happened in that moment. And so these moments are available to us right this very moment. Uh, and it's just a matter of waking up to them. So that's the awakening part. The word for sudden enlightenment that we use in, in Zen, dun in Chinese, is really just the word for readiness readiness to take this on, readiness to be for everything. It's an interesting word in, uh, in the Old Testament. There's a story about, a horrifying story about Jacob and Isaac, where Jacob leads his son up to be, you know, take up on the hillside. And uh, the Lord in the um, Bible says, Jacob, and he says, Hin -ani. it's in, in Hebrew. And it's uh, repeated many times during the uh, Old Testament, here am I that sense of being, I don't know what's going to come next, but I'm ready for whatever comes up. And that's a very important aspect of Zen as well, that we share with that, that the Hebrew tradition, and I'm sure uh, as well for that. So it's interesting to see that parallel in that way. Yeah, okay. Well, so maybe just to sort of check in with where we are a little bit. 
I would like to get out the wireless microphone and sort of offer that for people if they'd like to ask some questions and even participate in this part. It is recorded, so please only speak if you uh, don't mind that. But I, I want to take a moment, I think, perhaps to, to maybe sort of check in perhaps with what it is to find ourselves in this context. Because... You know, it's something of a, in many respects, it's a, I'm, I'm personally quite comfortable jumping in and all of a sudden there's realization over here and there's Jesus over there and there's cultivating a loving relationship with the sacred connection as one over, over here. And there's a way in which these words, if we use them, and I don't think that's what's taking place here. But if we, if we use these words and if we get lost in the abstraction of it, without returning in some important sense to the reality of our being together here and our sharing attention and the possibility to participate in communication together, the very fact we're here in communication together, for me itself is a profoundly grounding thing. The fact that we are here as influence, influencing each other, in communication, of course, it's organized in a particular way and we'll move into different processes later. But there's something really quite incredible for me that is realized on the pulse of expression that we realize together as we exchange and being ready for that in some important sense, returning to a kind of readiness and awareness of that moment, of that possibility at least I'd say that and invite that as a way in which to return to something that's quite grounding. Anyway, I, I wonder how you each sort of reflect about now that we find ourselves in this experience together. I, I like to do this sometimes to, to kind of bring an awareness to the process of conversation itself and bring an awareness to various threads of meaning that have been shared and and maybe what that might stimulate in terms of what it is to take that on, paying attention to a particular kind of generative tension. But my hope is for contexts like this, and, and personally what I hope to contribute to creating in culture, is a context in which it is both possible to share in a very deep sense an articulation or an expression of our loving connection to the world you know in, in that sense to share what we deeply care about and share what we value and to share in what ways we've learned that but also to speak in to that which perhaps we don't understand and that perhaps might draw us into a state of uncertainty about whether or not the communication that I'm a part of is in fact addressing something profound about how I feel I need to be addressed here. If we're to speak about such things as connection, then is it possible to speak, it, to speak forth in what way I am feeling potentially disconnected? You know? And um, in, across so many issues in culture, it's very difficult to get together and relate with differences in opinion. And there's so much power in the world, and we are such powerful beings in many ways, and so ignorant in many ways, that I think we have to develop a capacity to be with the tension of difference and not knowing together. And it strikes me that a context in which we can speak about that which we care about most deeply, and come to respect each other in that process, is one that can perhaps also be with generative tension in a particular kind of way and I'm not feeling any specific thing to to ask in relationship to that I'm not experiencing you know a profound kind of lack but I am saying this because I just want to open the presence of what it can be to be together in relationship with this you know um, many people have different experiences with religion and might in many ways feel perhaps I can experience anything, uh, I can experience a sense of the sacred perhaps 
in uh, purely secular terms. You know, if we think about meaning, progress, tradition, of course there's great lines of development throughout history, particularly over the last four or five hundred years, where the enlightenment in the sense of modernity, in the sense of things like science and reason and mathematics and what have you, of course these are coming out of an era in which the very possibility for contact reality with reality was already framed in terms of some sort of divine connection and some God-given possibility. And so these things are always interpenetrating, but nevertheless it was cultivated that it was possible for us to know the world without appeal to divinity or something like that which is beyond, you know, science or what have you. And this is a powerful force in the world, you know, maybe associated often with a kind of progressive secularism, whether communist or socialist or materialist in various ways, capitalist. And we swim in these waters, we swim in these waters of progress, right? And here we're also speaking to different traditions, we're speaking to different lineages in which learning has been passed along and it's been felt valuable to do that because of its affordance for connecting us and homing us in the world. And so maybe we can go ahead, Lindsay. I'm really interested in the idea of progress and how we work out whether something is progress or not. What are the criteria on which we, I mean we, because we've all got to share the same space, um, how we work out whether something is authentically progress as we understand it, a moving forward, because it, in history, of course, some things that have seemed like progress actually have been regress. Um, there's just no question about that. And what are the criteria we bring to um, a decision whether we should act on something or not, or how we live our lives, or how we share our lives? And I think one of the interesting things about the Enlightenment, which has brought so many good things, and, and in some ways, uh, secularism and the, the idea of the individual uh, and the dignity of each individual stems from a Christian tradition. It, was a, it, it certainly wasn't Aristotle who said that everyone was equal. or It, it was the, one of the gifts, although it may have been overladen with some terrible history, that Christianity brought was the idea that, that um, there was a fundamental dignity to every human person. And that communion, if I can use a religious word, or community, uh, shouldn't be divided up as it was in the Roman Empire. And so you find the first church in Europe was made up of some rich women. This is in Paul's letter to the Philippians, some rich women. Uh, a, 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 a girl who was mentally ill and a jailer and his family. And they sit down and eat together. Unheard of in the, in the tradition of the Roman Empire. And before, to be perfectly honest. And so there's this idea that the individual has a dignity, but only in communion with others. And I think one of the interesting things about, about the Enlightenment, which has brought so much, and the, the I think, therefore I am, is that the I has overtaken the we, it, it seems to me at the moment. And, and without a common sense of that, what happens when I and what I want and need um, is the same as yours, in fact, might be in conflict with that? How do we find a common sense of living together? What are the, what are the things that we bring to to the table and say, well, actually, and I think it's, for me, it, um, it, as, a, as a Western person, I suppose, but um, with a little sort of scratching the surface of the Eastern tradition, uh, I, I, I worry, one of the things I worry about most is, is our seeming inability to marry the I with the we. Um, and to define ourselves over and against one another. In other words, I, find, I am me because I'm different from you. When in fact, the truth is, we're more the same than we are anything else, but biologically. And maybe that's a clue to how we discover life, life um, together. And I think it's a real struggle for us at the moment. We can't even disagree. As far as I can, in the public space, people can hardly disagree without 
completely destroying the other and certainly without listening. Yeah, beautiful. Thank you, Lindsay. Sita, I don't know if you were glancing at me as though that might be a nice place to jump in. Yeah, I just sort of linking into what you were saying, Lindsay, is I um, actually had a lot of admiration for you, Tim, when you were bring, bringing together an interfaith event because I once had an experience at series of bringing together all of the different faiths that use series and it was terrible. It went very badly. <laughs> and I feel like one of the reasons that it went badly was that everybody just wanted to talk about their thing. So it kind of went around and everyone said their thing and then the next person's just waiting to talk about their thing. Mm. And there was no, I think what you're touching on Tim and what you're trying to do here, which is different, is that generative aspect of coming together. Like what is the new thing that is created when we bring these things together and how do we you know, in um, the nature-based leadership program that I do at Ceres, we have this practice of, like, listening from the heart and responding from the heart and trying really hard not to prepare what you're going to say or listening with the intent to reply. <laughs> and so I feel like how do we, as communities, listen from the heart in the moment, respond from the heart, and what is the new, the unknown, the new thing that comes together it's not actually a smooshing together of all of these mm. things either mm. that we right. do keep difference but there's in something new that can emerge yeah beautiful thank you so much i think that really took things on very nicely go on then kirk um it's interesting the poet gary snyder uh, once said that uh, we live in a very interesting time and that this is the first time in our history that there's been sort of the meeting of West and East, that the West, he said, brought us the idea that social justice could occur, that societies could um, move forward in terms of um, justice for all and in terms of uh, taking care of the poor and so forth. And the East brought forward this idea that there's interbeing and there's a non-dual uh, basis at the heart of it. And this is really, it's only been a hundred years since these two views have come together and, and the East, Eastern side is really only now starting to form a sense of presence in our culture. So this is interesting times in terms of that sense of uh, we've never been here before and that this is a time when we can start to look anew at what is needed. Um, one of the fundamental aspects of, of Zen and I think of all religions is really is that there is no um, salvation or awakening without other people, that it doesn't just happen, like a lioness doesn't sit there in the jungle and be perfect on their own. She has to be adapted and make sense and be relevant in that, in that situation. And that's the same thing for all of us as well. Our own sense of uh, whatever uh, freedom we attain has to, it can only happen because we are related to the world. There is no me without you, and there is no me without the whole universe. And there is no universe without me <laughs> or you. So that whole sense of interbeing really is a big part of what we talk about in terms of this, this view. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and look, the, 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 the motivation, the inspiration, the hope that motivates me to draw this together and to continue to create these contexts and hopefully to create these contexts together is precisely because it, it seems to me that in gathering and aspiring to a certain quality of what it is to communicate, of what it is to learn and recognize, in some sense, both the the truth value and the, and the misleading nature of language. There's a very real sense in which, it, you know, I'm like monkey plus one or two things making mouth vibrations, right? And that's a silly perspective. It's a silly perspective in a way. It's a silly perspective in a way. And yet, only because it destroys a bunch of context and a bunch of meaning that we've been able to develop together over a long period of time because we developed a capacity to speak with each other, because we developed a capacity to share meaning in various forms, and we've developed a sense of identity and touch with intelligible pattern of the world that have been transmitted through, across cultures, across different lineages, 
and we can meet here and express using language that is not any one of ours, but is again something in this commons space, in this me and you space, that allows us to illuminate and participate together and share in understanding. And we can be responsive to context. We can be responsive to when there's, for instance, discontinuity, the kind of discontinuity associated with the sort of absurd perspective of just being a monkey making mouth vibrations. And yet, it's not entirely. It, that itself is not so out of tune that we cannot come into meaningful relationship with it. Because we do have to remember in some important sense that the way in which we name the way in which we can name what matters to us, the, name, the way in which we can relate our own stories of developing relationship with spirituality, with the sacred and what have you, they come through our own journeys. And yes, of course, they come through a context of me and you and we that allows us to understand them and sort of co-develop. But nevertheless, when I attempt to speak them, how, 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 how well can I possibly do? How well can I name myself that allows you to get to know me? It's for sure got to be an exchange back and forth. It's for sure got to be a process that we develop and cultivate over time together. And, and the hope and the intention here is to point to the necessity again of this context that allows difference and identity to come together and generate ways of knowing, generate a kind of quality of communication that makes it possible to perceive that future together in which there is a possibility for together. Uh, this is a silly thing really but that's, I remember being told by a priest who told me that I talk too much oh shit yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh sorry no I wasn't no, I, was talking about, I was talking to myself not to you <laughs> but, but on the other hand the, the, and, and he said, he said can, I just, can I just remind you Lindsay that in God's wisdom he gave us two ears and just one mouth and that the key to speaking is listening. It sounds a bit trite, but actually, my God, we need more listening to one another before we speak. And um, there was a Christian, uh, Roman Catholic, actually, Hans Kung, who said, talk, he's talking about talking about God, but it's true about generally, any talk that doesn't start with silence and end with silence doesn't know what it's talking about. And there is such a fear of silence in our culture, generally. It's just the absence of noise. And uh, we only have to see, by the way, a person can't be alone. Because they've always got the world in their hand. And their security is found there. So I almost say now that it's like, uh, if you haven't got your iPhone, your hand's been chopped off. That's how it feels like. And this is all a fear of silence. So therefore no one's saying anything worth hearing, because they're not listening. And. Uh, that, to me, that's one of the keys to learning to be silent, to have constant. Because my mind's like a tree full of monkeys most of the time when I am silent. Well, that's two of us. Yeah. <laughs> two monkeys on a stage. <laughs> so maybe we can open this up. Thank you so much uh, for the conversation. Um, what was coming to me was we're in sort of a crisis of meaning and a crisis of faith and a crisis of... I guess, being able to identify with each other and in some sense, ourselves. And I think that's got something to do with um, what Friedrich Nietzsche declared, you know, 130 years ago. I see that as having a, an immeasurable impact. Um, I think various practices have... Uh, are seeing changes in the world that reflect, uh, I guess, a tuning out. And our culture resonates, like different pockets of our culture resonate differently to, you know, Buddhism and uh, Christianity and the different practices in, in the Middle East. And I wonder if you have any thoughts on how would you foster more connection or, or open up access for this, for this connection to create a shared meaning together through your practices. <laughs> I think one of the things that first comes to mind in terms of your question, I, I really like that question. I'd like to 
ask you at some point about what you mean by the meaning crisis, because that's a word that's been used a lot, but we can t take that on. But um, one of the things that we're often unwilling to do and yet is most necessary is to be with our experience, particularly pain or uh, truthfulness or vulnerability. And a lot of the difficulties that we, um, and the suffering that we are creating, you know, through our technology, through uh, ignoring each other, through our handheld world, as you said, I like that term, uh, is, is, uh, is unwillingness to be with the actual experience of our lives. And, um, and that takes a lot of discipline and it takes a lot of, uh, it takes uh, a, a vocabulary. There's a number of things that can really help with that. Um, and that's why I do what I do, because it's one way of doing that. But um, there's an old story that um, a, a, a woman was there enthralled listening to a guru speak or something, and she had her little child and ran off into the bushes and got bit by a snake. And everybody said, what do we do with the child? This child, is get, the poison is throwing through the child's system. And the wise person nearby said, you must tell the truth. And the woman said, well, I don't really love my husband. And the husband said, well, I don't really practice, I'm a bit of a criminal in terms of my business. And the monk said, I, I don't really believe what everything that I say. But as each of them was with their truth as it was, as painful as it was, it was able to heal the child. It's a metaphor, but <laughs> that's the, the process of being with those things that are often really difficult and often shunned. Uh, un, un, our society doesn't want us to, you know, to admit to these things, you know, fill in the blank there, but um, that's one step. <laughs> that's one thing I could say about that. Yeah, great question. I feel like I'm still exploring that for myself, the answer to your question. Um, one, I'm, I run this nature-based leadership program at the moment. It's like a year-long program um, with my friend Claire Dunn. She wrote a book called My Year Without Matches and then Rewilding the Urban Soul. And um, as part of the program, we talk a lot about um, village building and village building technologies. Um, and really what that kind of that theme is about is learning how to live in relationship with each other again. And one of the um, readings that we have for that segment is, I don't know if you've read it, Martin Prechtel, I never know how to say his last name, but it's called Long Life, Honey in the Heart. It's an amazing book title. And he um, talks about the idea of mutual in indebtedness, which is, you know, in our Western culture, we have this idea that if we can die free of any attachments like... Um, then we've won at life. Um, you know what I mean? Like we're complete individuals. We don't owe anyone anything. No one owes us anything. Um, you know, we've organised all of our possessions. We're done. Um, but in this village that he was living in in Guatemala, um, this idea of mutual indebtedness was there, and which is that you are an elder in that culture if you have... Um, if you have the most connections and so one way he realized this was that he borrowed some money from some other elders in the village to participate in a um, initiation ritual and then after he participated in that he then tried to pay them back and they didn't want the money back they're like no we can't take the money back and he couldn't understand kept trying to pay them back and they actually threw rocks at him to get him to go away um, because the idea is that as elders, if, if he owes them something, then there's this relationship there. They're indebted to each other and they, um, they have that for life. And I feel like we need to relearn how to be indebted to each other. And I think that feels quite uncomfortable as a concept. And I'm not personally that comfortable with it, but I really loved this idea. So. Mm, that's really interesting, actually. <laughs> I quite like Nietzsche, actually. Needless to say, I don't agree with him, but, but he was what I would call a noble atheist. Unlike with respect, which means I'm going to criticise, the new atheists, who I think are rather shallow in their atheism, at least Nietzsche, who, uh, who by the way, said God is dead. Well, actually, it's Nietzsche who's dead. God is not quite dead yet. But, you know, that's, he's sort of, he may be you know, suffering a bit, but he's not dead. Um, yeah, but, but what Nietzsche talked about, he... he, he lamented what would happen with, with the death of God and the loss of transcendence and nobility and sacrifice. 
And these are key uh, questions in the, exp in the experiment, you would expect me to say, the experiment of in secularism and atheism of life without the idea of God. Um, in, in terms of how one conveys what one has to share, Augustine of Hippo, who's one of my great heroes, the fifth, fourth and fifth century um, failure of a bishop, really small congregation, the Vandals came and this Christianity has never recovered in North Africa um, since then. But he once said, and this, this could be said now, God has got so much to give you, but your hands are too full. There's nowhere for him to put it. And actually, in the end, the greatest step forward in a person's life is for them to acknowledge their need. And until a person acknowledges their need, it doesn't matter how good what you've got to offer, whatever it is, unless there's room. And sometimes, in the religious traditions, you're sort of hanging around I don't mean longing for a person to be needy. That's not what I mean. Like a sort of hunter-gatherer waiting for someone to have a collapse. But in reality, that um, the acknowledgement of need in the teachings of Jesus, the, the Sermon on the Mount begins with, blessed are those who know their need of God, who, who acknowledge their poverty of spirit. Um, so that means that you may have a good product, but doesn't mean someone's going to, uh, you know, find it yet now at this particular moment. In terms of meaning, I, I, I think that's you've talked about the crisis of meaning, and, and working out, you know, what is life for? Uh, am I made just to be happy? Is my life the exploration, and and I have a right to be happy, and so on? If that's the narrative. What happens when you're not? What do you do then? What, 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 if you have your version of what, what, your life, what you expect your life to, to bring to you, and it doesn't bring it, where do you go then? Where do, where do you go then? I think that's really one of the interesting questions for us. Thank you. Um, with love, before we progress, can we? Um, so I'm going to call on one of my favourite feminist teachers, Sarah Ahmed, um, who talks about being the tension in the room and be the tension in the room, and ask that we stop and acknowledge country, and um, that we are here on the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, in this newly renamed local council area of Mary Beck, where reconciliation is at the heart of everything that we do, and from. It's wonderful. I'm just so excited listening to you all. But I, I'm just so aware that we are living on a planet that is several generations away from potentially being uninhabitable by humans. And you were talking about um, our responsibility and our indebtedness and what that means for our indebtedness to the future of the planet um, in our relationship to each other now and our relationship to the people that are coming after us given that there's a chance there's only going to be a few more left for the first, like our generation of the first people that are, are facing that complete exist, existential annihilation. It's a very real reality in how we can contextualise that with our faith. Yeah, beautiful. Thank you for bringing all of that in. There's certainly some powerful energy and awareness about the predicament of the ecology we're a part of is critical to all of this and developing context in which it's possible to be in a relationship of tension with that is for me something I can practically point to as a response to all of this it's sort of been the contention that building those contexts, attempting to mutually generate those contexts for mutual learning in relationship to this is one of the main things that's missing. It's without that, we can have all the broadcast communication we like through the internet or what have you. Or perhaps we can also share our fears and frustrations and our 
and also our, our insight about maybe solutions. But if we're not in a state of openness to listen and communicate and also engage perhaps dialectically in that process because it's so complex that it's an ongoing thing to relate with, then it's not going to be possible to develop a real address. And so thank you for bringing all of that in. I think it's something which invites us to consider the criticality of relating with progress in, in a virtuous, in the virtuous sense of progress. Certainly if we want to think about what it is to advance our capacity for understanding and cultivating awareness about ecological patterns and to build that awareness into social process in such a way that we can navigate with more wisdom and we can say, okay, well, we're updating our traditions well, right? And uh, it does seem to me to be the case that there are, in, very, in a very re really important way, novel developments throughout history. You can call them emergencies, perhaps. You can think about different epochs of climate, epochs of environment, certainly the advent of technology, the changes of the media that afford our communication. It's for sure the case that the Bible and the Buddha, and no matter how mystical you want to get, there was not like imprinted how to relate to a world in which Facebook and Twitter exist, right? And how that affects human cognition and what it is to communicate. And so there's a bunch of technological developments which require us to develop understanding about them, right? And to, in that process, also remember perhaps what we really don't want to forget about, well, the many ways in which the sacred can come to be named. And so there's obviously so much here to continue conversation with. I want to be conscious of our time and the fact that we've got a process to undergo together this evening and we can return to this conversation. May I just yes, of add course. something very brief in response um, that I have come to feel very strongly about is that um, we're in the climate crisis, polycrisis, um, that we're not in a crisis of carbon emissions, we're in a crisis of relationship and we're in a spiritual crisis. And that the, only, and that the root of the root cause of what we find ourselves in is healing those things, is healing separation. Um, from ourselves, from our communities, from our earth. And that the, one of the reasons that I'm interested in these discussions and these gatherings is that I think we need to go to the root cause of what's going on in the world, which is this kind of what I would term a spiritual crisis. Thank you for the question. Yeah, it would be interesting to suggest the idea that one of the great steps forward in progress would be for people in the West to discover that happiness is to be found in being poorer which would be a return to an early Christian tradition and some other traditions, and to a more of a common life, rather than the ideal having your own place, to recover a communion. I think um, these are the interesting questions about our redefining our expectations of what life is going to bring to us, or that we can demand or expect, and they need to shift. But we'll probably find a in my experience, we need a, a greater motivation than it's just a, than it's an idea. And for me, it's a religious motivation, I have to say, that, that, that makes me want to do something that I don't want to do. <laughs> mm. Kirk, if you'd like to say anything before we bring this part to a close, you're totally welcome. I don't find anything radically different than has, what has been said. You know, it really seems like a time... You know, our minds evolved at a certain stage where we, you know, don't kill too many of the people we know and don't eat all the food at once and so forth. But it's really a time where we need a mind 2.0, as, uh, as Sito was saying, that um, uh, we a, a big part of the problem is maybe the word progress, that we have this idea that we have to progress in, in, in use poorly. We have to progress beyond. We have to progress to something, and we're... 
I think it was um, D.H. Lawrence that said, when you leap to heaven, you leave a devil where you stood. And often that's a technological metaphor that we're leaping to uh, a whole bunch of uh, senses of escapism that leave us uh, impoverished in a in not the way you mean, <laughs> but in a, a spiritual way here, and we we create that crisis in that way. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, guys, for for joining me in this. There's there's so much here that I would I'd love to continue with, and but now is not quite that time. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. That's fun. <laughs>
you know, most sense actually just to hear from the guests who joined us today, just in terms of bringing a bit of, bringing it back into a circle a little bit. Because there's a lot of enthusiasm and there's a lot of, there's a lot of goodness to what it is to come together. And at the same time, there's, um, yeah, there's a very much a, a, a dignity to be remembered for the history that brings us to this point. And um, yeah, I, I think I was finding myself actually wanting to pass it over to, pass it over to Lindsay. It was just, I'd love to hear from your sort of experience of sort of the evening and what's whatever's sort of coming through for you to share in relation to this. And it can be anything at all. And um, there's no need to bring things to a final hole. There's something, there's almost never enough for these things for me because it's, um, there's so much, yeah, it's, I mean, these things aren't even, we're not even in a proper circle. So, but anyway, here you are. Well, it doesn't matter that it's not really complete because there's always tomorrow until we die anyway. So there's always a tomorrow to keep on conversation and reflecting and... Um, uh, I think um, the, the moment I've, I've, I've enjoyed, and thank you very much for asking me, it's quite an interesting thing for a person who, who knows when he walks into a, a room isn't just an individual but embodies an institution that has a mixed history and very mixed feelings about it, not least in Brunswick, to be perfectly honest. Um, so it's quite a personally, um, well, it's hardly brave, but it's quite an interest. You don't know what's going to happen. Oh, it's it, you know, and in the same way as I said, you came out when we opened the cafe and just opened ourselves to much more than just the people who happen to be exploring Christianity. So it's really... Um, Wonderful, really, and challenging. And the, and the best moment was when someone, when we'd been talking niceties, when someone in the group I was in then named that. And uh, named what exactly? Named that 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 um, uh, the dis dissonance between some of the things I was saying in the institution, I the experience of the institution, yeah, and people's feeling about the church, and um, that was not easy to hear. That I know it's true. Um, and uh, so that was good. And what was good was that um, there could be quite serious uh, disagreement and yet sameness. And uh, I think that person will come and come to the cafe someday and pay for a coffee. I didn't tell him that as well. That's the other and double. Stay there that's for four hours. and stay there for four hours. <laughs> yeah, keep, yeah, we have a we have a, that's all right. We have a sign out said we're never in a hurry for you to leave. I'm not sure that will always be the case, but anyway. Good. Um, so to me, that is very, uh, from a personal point of view, uh, and uh, um, uh, that's um, my life, and we all represent more than ourselves um, once we sign up to some creed or place or belonging, actually. Um, uh, uh, so that's been, uh, is for me a very interesting experience. And what is uh, great, if I may say, and I don't mean this in any way except that it's, I'm probably um, unpalatably the oldest person in the room, which, you know, is, um, it is, so I don't mean this in any other way, that I think it is fantastic um, to be in a space where people are thinking. You know, Tragedy can be that the cafe latte you buy in my cafe isn't satisfying. We are in Melbourne. We are in Melbourne, exactly. <laughs> I once gave a talk, wake up and smell the incense rather than wake up and smell the coffee because we need to think beyond to, to the deeper stuff. Uh, so, and sometimes those questions are by definition hard and there's no complete answer. And there's always more to be said and thought about and learned. So we, we can tend to just put the hard questions off, particularly in our culture, because we've got a credit card to pay for the next thing that can distract us. If in doubt, go shopping. It used to be a distortion of Descartes, I shop, therefore I am. Uh, so with this, we can afford distractions which take us away from 
the deepest questions. And even if um, the deepest questions lead us into disagreement, because we can still go further deep, there's some possibility of staying in relationship. And the truth is, the deeper we go, and this is, I found, in interreligious dialogue, and interfaith dialogue, and amongst Christians who can't even, dis can't even agree completely, that the deeper you go, the more common ground you find. That, that is the truth. And it's shallow thinking that leads to division, not deep thinking. Deep thinking will always have humility about it, because there is always more to be discovered. It is shallow thinking that leads to division, not deep thinking. Anyway, so. Thank you, Lindsay. Thank you very much. So, uh, final couple minutes. I'll just pass it over very briefly to Sita and Kirk, if you feel called. What you were just saying, Lindsay, about the deep thinking reminded me of, um, I don't know if anybody's been to India, but whenever I go to India, I always try and talk to a strange guru of some kind. And last time I was there, I was told by my strange Indian guru um, that I needed to think, um, think better, not more. And he said it twice, think better, not more, because I often get that hamster wheel brain kind of thing going, and he's like, no, do it better. Um, I actually, I have a little poem, it's very short, very, very short, by Hafiz, and I just want to read it out. Is that all right? I just, it's just in my bag there. So, I'm just gonna... so this is by Hafiz, who's 14th century Persian poet. What is the root of all these words? One thing, love. But a love so deep and sweet it needed to express itself with scents, sounds, and colors that never before existed. I'll be very, very brief. <laughs> Just love the words, uh, what um, uh, we've been talking about. I was, the word uh, humility came up uh, just before, and that idea of humility, which is to touch the ground, hummus, the the ground is is, is uh, has been a big part of my experience of this tonight. And just the overall experience, there's three words that sort of come up for me as well. One, one is warmth, that there's a sense of wanting to connect, wanting to understand, wanting to have these conversations. One is curiosity. And that idea that uh, we, we don't know, and so we're going to find out. We don't know, so we're going to explore. We don't know, and so we're going to just try saying something from the heart without knowing what will come out. And finally, being wholehearted. And I've really experienced this group here is very much a wholehearted group, and this has been a wholehearted conversation. And I thank you very much for letting me be part of it.